Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to anyone and everyone around the world. My name is Chris Bulin, and welcome to Devastation Deconstructed. So how was your overall Devastation experience? And if you had any expectations, did the event differ from them at all? Yeah, it was really interesting, actually. Um, my, my initial thoughts uh, about how it would go didn't really go to plan. I, I came in with a, a very concise plan, but unfortunately, um, after match one, um, uh, throwing Dash into its worst matchup, that um, Turbo Sonata, like OTK deck that Jason was playing, kind of kind of threw me a new one. Um, and then I didn't get the matchups I wanted. In fact, I think I got the worst matchup at each of my decks um, in the three rounds. But hey, anything can happen. Um, and it's certainly a, a, a lot different. Um, I came with really targeted decks that were only targeting like one or two matchups, but when that plan kind of got derailed, I didn't have the, the sort of consistency that you need across like all the matchups and I wanted to power through the, the all the matchups that I got, like you would probably plan for in a um, more and more diverse tournament. So it kind of got twisted on its head a little bit there. Going into the experience, I think all of us had very different mindsets on um, depending on what the draft ended up being. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the placement in the draft actually really dictated the pace um, and, and the outcome of, um, of the devastation in general. And um, I'm not sure if others have mentioned, but we actually did kind of like a mock up draft to see what people would have, have what people would have drafted. Um, if they got a different placement, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so um, we did one where we basically switched around places, and ba everyone got different heroes, except for like um, I think all but one heroes per uh, play were different. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that really, you know, that that variance there really dictated the the, the format. It was a really exciting experience. Um, it was, it was a lot different from any like real world um, experience, but we got to see like things that you wouldn't normally see in your normal armory. You don't go to your armory and there'd be 12 different heroes, for example. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. And um, did you kind of, did you get the heroes that you had your eye on or how did that fall? To be honest, if you ranked all 12 heroes and which ones I wanted, I probably got the top three I wanted. Damn, not bad, eh? Yeah, it was pretty bad drafting on other other people's part. Yeah, well, I didn't want to say so myself, but... Yeah, um, they should have never let me get chain. Yeah? <laughs> the tournament structure was great. Mm. I, I actually really enjoyed that kind of tournament where we had one of each deck battling against each other mm. instead of versing the same deck over and over, <laughs> right? Like, not to name any names. Not to name, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was actually really fun because it was a kind of like mind games mm. where you can where if you're first seeing someone, you know exactly what what three heroes they have, and then you can build around what you're gonna play, what you're gonna send in against them. So it's kind of it was really strategic like that. Let's chat a bit about the classic constructed metagame out in the wild, uh, particularly a couple of these Road to Nationals events have been quite influential in shaping that. Mm -hmm. Pretty healthy metagame? I'd say so. I think what we're seeing is um, I always talk a lot about uh, kind of last year, New, New Zealand was the kind of main country that was really into flesh and blood on the, into the competitive scene. And now we're seeing flesh and blood develop their own metagames all over the world. And that's something that really excites me is how the metagame changes depending on the, um, the area that you play in. You know, I feel like we're, we're, what we're seeing is there's a lot of these kind of micro metagames developing. Yeah. Uh, depending on your area um, and you know we've seen uh, things like Hatchet Dorinthia take out wins we've seen things like uh, the Saber Bolton combo even an OTK Viscerai taking it out so um, I feel like there's a lot more emphasis if you want to win um, to have be be very mindful of what the people that are going to turn up at that particular tournament are going to be playing it's almost like where we're seeing like actual shifts in the meta now where people are kind of uh, seeing what is good, adapting to it, which I think is a really healthy thing to see in a meta game. Sure, yeah. like, um, the, like just recently we saw a shift with uh, the Katsu control decks um, that were shutting down Chain and then we've seen this uprising in Dash to kind of counter those Katsu control decks. So we've, we've kind of got this, this much larger, much more diversified meta, which I think is really healthy for the game. 
I've never seen that much variety in, in the format. And then it, it just shows that people, that any deck has a chance of beating other decks. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's not only the old classic rock, paper, scissors sort of metagame triangle, but just innovation. Yeah. People are trying new things. Like, even inside not only one, uh, one class or one hero, but even inside of that hero, there's multiple archetypes with, you know, like the Boltons and the Dorinthias and yeah, yeah, like that. yeah. Especially Bolton, man. But Bolton's been, Bolton's been killing it in the in the road to national seasons. There is a distinct deck that each player can play depending on their style. It's like the three pillars of the that we see up here is kind of like your Katsu, Bravo, and Chain. Mm -hmm. And if you're like an aggressive player, or even maybe you're like a combo player, you want to be playing Chain. If you are more about like like control with a little bit of like doing big stuff, you really want Bravo. But if you're about control but knowing when to put your pressure on, you should like Katsu. I think the meta name's actually like really nice. And not only not only that, outside of the top three decks, we see a like a mix of at least five different decks that can compete with these. Like we see our Bolton, our Prison. I think mechanologists and maybe like Rhino is like doing great as well. Yeah, it's it's so so healthy and um, even in so, like something like Bolton, people were out there playing all sorts of different weapons, all sorts of different archetypes. What do you think about that? I mean, that's that's what our game is kind of designed for. Like you're gonna play as your hero, mm. but for your choice within the hero is what weapons, what equipment do you want to bring. Every little decision coming I mean, down to a very start of what weapon you submitted. It's going to make a huge difference in every tournament you play. All right, so you played Dorinthia, Azalea, and the bad boy Katsu. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the impact and the waves that these heroes have been making out in the wild format of Classic Constructed? Cool, so um, Dorinthia's been a killer mm -hmm. recently. It's been topping Road to Nationals, been winning Road to Nationals. I think it's just because of the the raw damage that Dorothy has, and then as well as the armor mm. that she can defend with, which is like the fridge, the fridge, so, so. the fridge, right? It's like it's a like extra ten defense sometimes. So yeah, Dorothy is great. Has a lot of offense, has a lot of defense. Mm -hmm. What you want to do? Katsu is like it's just Katsu, man. It's like <laughs> that deck. That deck is always good, no matter what what style you like to play it, even mm -hmm. aggro or control or even mid-range that I've been seeing lately. And then, because it has good matchups against mostly everything, if you're playing mid-range, yeah. you can play aggro, like you can side out the defense reactions and stuff against chain and just race them. Mm -hmm. Or if you're playing against uh, like Bravo deck, you can just put more put more cards in and then just try to like fatigue them out and aggro them out. So that's good. Yeah. And then Azalea, well, Azalea has just speaking of like maybe last last road to, last week road to nationals and Isaiah the actually top date yeah yeah uh, one of them and then that was really cool I think Isaiah is still a very sleeper she has a lot of powerful cards such as Red and Ledger yeah. Remorseless like those cards like can easily destroy a matchup if it successfully if it successfully hits right yeah, yeah. so hit them right in the right in the right spot yeah. right at the right time and there's not then, much they can do about it yeah. So th that's how those three decks are in the meta right now. But no normally we just see the Katsu decks making like, most top cuts at Road to Nationals, and Dorothy deck is eh, it's like 50, 60 percent. Yeah, there's a lot out there. And then sometimes it's like maybe there's one or two that sneaks in every week, so that that's great. Yeah, yeah that's cool. They're very cool. So you played Levia, Chain, and Viserai. How do you see these guys sort of fitting into that World Classic Constructed meta, specifically in the recent Road to Nationals? Well, as everyone knows, Chain is one of the most dominant decks in the Road to Nationals, and that's not by surprise. That's not a surprise. Like the reason Chain is so is so good, other than the fact that it's like fundamentally really strong, a lot of people are playing it because it's actually quite forgiving. Um, your your game plan is really linear and it's all about your opponent adjusting to what you're doing but most people right now haven't really figured out how to adjust to chain so chain will win a lot more than really should. in addition if you make a mistake with chain a lot of the time you can get bailed out and you might like defend incorrectly on the last turn and then 
you get bowed out because you have good banishes with chain. However, when you're playing against chain, there is no room for error. That two damage you forgot to defend on turn three, yeah, that's gonna lose you the game. Yeah, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of decks that are sort of dependent on what you're doing. But you made a really good point about chains sort of, it's, it's what the opponent is doing. Yeah, so the, mo the biggest thing about chain is like, you need to know when your opponents are planning to set up defense reactions at Arsenal, defending with the entire hand, when they've got a snag and when they're gonna defend with their equipment and also to some extent when they're gonna do like really annoying attacks like Spinal Brush. And that's what you have to really like focus on when you're playing it from the chain side. But chain just has like so many tools to combat this and you also, even if you're not playing around these, a lot of times you can actually just get bailed out by your soul shackles. So you play Dash, Bolton, and Bravo in the Devastation event. Yeah. Just touch a little bit on sort of uh, Bravo's spot and minor, possibly major, Dash Resurgence. What are your thoughts on these three heroes in the world classic constructed meta? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start off with the one that I probably thought the least about, which is Sir Bolton. Sir Bolton is actually one of my like favorite heroes from, from all the sets. He probably ranks third, third or fourth on my, on my favorite hero scales. Um, he's just a really strong, aggressive deck that also can have some, some control combo options um, that we see with the Centauri Sabres, Lumina Ascension combo deck. Not personally how I like to run Bolton, but definitely a very viable strategy that you can use in some metas. So Bravo's typically kind of been the, the ultimate control deck for a while. It's got good matchups all round. It can kind of beat through anyone. It's a very good deck to play to kind of show your play skill, how well you can set up a deck, how well you're able to evaluate a board game, how many threats you need left in your deck. It's a, it's a very precise mm. um, kind of deck of hero and uh, class to play, that being Guardian. Um, and I suppose I should sort of touch into my, my dash deck as well. Yeah. Um, my dash was like my, my chain killer, was my katsu killer, it was the, the deck I was going to rely on most for the most wide variety of matchups. It was my only deck which I rocked Arcane Barrier with. Yeah, so I knew that not I needed, much of that. No, not much of that. So that was gonna be my my, my, my Cannon Killer as well. Uh, and so I was relying on that deck a lot. So probably in hindsight, I probably should be holding it back a bit more and lift that as my deck in reserve. But hey, decision was made, mistakes were made, and, and that's what ended up happening. But because of those decisions I made, and I made it, tried to make it as good as I possibly could against as many decks as I could, um, I left to win some awkward spots, like in that matchup versus OTK Viscera. If I didn't have to play the, the Command and Conquers and I could play some more boost attack cards, mm. I think I would have been a lot more favored in that matchup, having less misses in my deck, just being a more consistent, uh, aggressive kind of combo we deck would be really good over those couple of arcane barriers or a couple of defense reactions that I've played so I can swap the deck over to control for certain matchups. Mm. And so I think uh, if I managed to play it as a, as a more combo orientated or a more mid-range orientated deck, I think I probably would have uh, had a much better game versus that, uh, um, that, that Sonata deck. Yeah, yeah. Very unique format. So um, some sort of decisions, deck building, matchup combinations that might not have come up in a traditional classic constructed format. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you did pretty well. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <Yeah>. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the record states otherwise, but I, I, I appreciate it. So you drafted Kano, Prism, and your boy Reiner. Mm -hmm. And how do you think the well, kind of what what waves have these guys been making? What impacts out there in the classic constructed world mm -hmm. meta? Yeah. So Kano and Reiner have made a few top eights. I believe it's a bit less than ten um, overall over the road to nationals. And I feel like Kano, in particular, is kind of. Uh, that hero that can really punish once once better game evolves and people are running out of those kind of spare sideboard slots and they start trimming null runes mm. null run equipment and they stop being kind of worried about Kano it seems like one of those uh, great heroes to pick up and punish those kinds of decks but um, unfortunately, you have to be really, really good. You have to know exactly what you're doing with Kano to um, kind of play it into a metagame where people still respect Kano and they still have those the known equipment. Um, so yeah, so I, it hasn't been performing as well, but it is kind of that um, yeah that one hero that can really 
turn the tide if, if it doesn't get enough respect. Uh, with Reiner, I'd say I'm actually surprised that Reiner isn't doing better. I feel like Reiner is a very strong hero. Mm. Uh, obviously, it has kind of that potential edge against Prism with the six plus power yeah. attacks that can pop phantasms. Um, you've got scab skins that gives you action points, so that's kind of can steer around the auras. Um, so there's just that one really good matchup there for for Reiner. Um, yeah, well, your, your last hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of Prism. awesome top eight performances so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Prism has been doing really well in the roads in terms of top eighting, but I think only one, maybe two uh, Prisms actually took a tournament out, mm. and I think that really shows that it's a hero that you can do really well with when your opponent doesn't quite know how to play around it. Mm. And I think it's a hero that um, punishes mistakes a lot. You know, the, the both Phantasms and Auras have that quality about them that if your opponent isn't quite sure about the matchup, chances are that you can build enough of an advantage to uh, do really well with. Mm. But then once you first get into those top eights and people know how to play around it, it makes it a lot harder. Um, and it's another hero that I think requires a lot of skill. Um, and there's, um, and it's actually quite surprising for a new class to have so many different what, different ways to build Prism. Um, so yeah, I think there is potential for Prism to do extremely well. I think the class is extremely strong, as you can see with the uh, top eights. But I think it still requires that. Um, there's a lot of kind of little things that you can improve while playing Prism to really get to that top level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's like she's not only so diverse and flexible as a as a hero or even a class, but mm -hmm. every game you just learn something. You learn mm -hmm. a little bit more, or um, the timing of, of this instant aura, mm -hmm. or there's just so much to learn every exactly. time. So yeah. um, it, it's really cool seeing so many Prisms in these top eights around the world. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to see if you pick up first place, and I think we'll see him a bit more soon. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, as it is a new class, and people are still getting their head wrapped around it, um, but I'm expecting some really good performances for Prism in the future.